Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's December. It's the 4th of December, 2022, and quite a few updates this week. As always, I have the chapters down the bottom so you can jump to a particular update. And new videos this week, I did a whole video about thinking that, hey, my application has certain requirements in terms of availability. And so how can I think about meeting those both with regard to the infrastructure it runs on, but also my application architecture itself. So I cover both of those elements. And because I did that video, I redid uh, my video on composite SLAs. I thought of some different ways to explain it. I think some better analogies. So I recreated that video and posted that. And then I did my first and only keynote, uh, it's my plan. And so I created a version, I recorded it, and I thought it may help people. It's about 45 minutes long. It's not technical. It's really about how I think about achieving my goals, how I think about life in general. So that may or may not interest you, but hey, it's there if it does. So on to what's new on the compute side. So the Azure App Service has some new language support. In Preview, it has Go as an experimental language. And then for GA, it has Python 3.10, PHP 8.1, and Node 18. There's some new VM SKUs available in Preview. So the HX and the HBV4. So these are both high-performance computing SKUs. They're powered by the new AMD CPUs. And it's really about, hey, giving me more performance um, and better cost effectiveness. They have 800 gigabytes per second of DDR5 memory bandwidth. They have 400 giggy, giggy bytes, uh, giggy bits of NVIDIA Quantum InfiniBand. They have uh, 80 gigabits per second of Azure just regular accelerated networking. And they both come between 24 and 176 physical cores. Um, the HB has 688 gigabytes of RAM. The HX has 1,408 gigabytes of RAM. And it doesn't matter how many cores you have in that range, you still have the same amount of RAM. So these are really designed for those very large, massively parallel workloads you may have. Azure Container Apps has a whole bunch of updates. Now remember, Azure Container Apps abstract away even the Kubernetes, things like Dapper, which is fantastic when I want to create my microservices, has a whole bunch of functionality to help me with those. Um, things like CADA for my, my auto scaling and other things like Mesh. It abstracts all of that away. It just makes it available so I can very, very easily just deploy my microservices. It's also serverless. It can scale all the way down to nothing. So with these now, I can build a container from my source machine and deploy it without having to have a Docker file. I can just use the AZ container app UP action, and it will just build it and run it into my Azure Container Apps instance. And for both Azure Pipelines, and I'll do it in one go, GitHub Actions, it has build and deploy capabilities. So using a pipeline for Azure DevOps, I can build, it will go to an Azure um, container registry and then go to my container app and exactly the same for GitHub Actions. And just like this functionality where I don't need a Docker file, well, I don't need a Docker file with the Azure Pipelines or the GitHub Actions either. There's now inbound IP restrictions. Now these can work in one of two ways. I can think about, hey, I'm gonna deny everything except these IPv4 side ranges you give me or allow everything except these IPv4 side ranges you give me. So I pick which one do I wanna deny by default or accept by default, and then I give it a set of IPv4 side ranges that will be the alternate to that. Either it will block it or it will allow it. Durable Functions now has .NET 7 isolated supports. So remember, um, sorry, Durable Functions are all about long running instances that are stateful of Azure Functions. Where Azure Functions are serverless, but these are really good where I have some stateful requirement. There's different models, how I use these statefuls. It could be the whole, hey, I fan out to multiple things going on and then fan back in. It might be chaining, it might be monitoring, there's some async call, whatever that is, I can now, within those durable functions, use .NET 7. And the whole point of isolated, it lets me use a runtime that's a different version than installed on the host operating system that's actually running that function. So that's why it's now in those isolated processes. 
And for Azure Kubernetes Service, now there's a native add-on for the Azure Blob CSI driver. This is really important. If I think about my pods, sometimes in my pod, I want some stateful storage. And Blob is super efficient. And there's technologies out there that let me mount Blob as a use, usable space. I could use, for example, Blob Fuse. I can use NFS3. But to do those in the past, I had to use this open source Blob driver that I really had to maintain and manage. Well, now, this Azure Blob CSI driver is just a managed add-on in AKS. So it takes away all of that extra work you previously had to do. On the database side, so Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL. Remember what used to be Postgres Hyperscale has now moved into its part of this Cosmos DB. This is the whole goal around these very high performance, very high capacity, uses Postgres, uses Citus. So now this Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL now supports Postgres 15. So there are a whole bunch of improvements over in memory, on disk sorting algorithms, better flexibility around expressions, query performance, a whole bunch of updates. But also Citus 11.1 .1 can now be used both with the Postgres 15 and Postgres 14. Remember it's the Citus that enables us to have things like distributed tables that let us shard the data over multiple databases to get that very large scale and distribute for that very high performance. There's now Blob storage integration. This now makes Blob a very nice staging area. Hey, I can copy my data to Blob and then it can seamlessly just integrate to my Cosmos DB for Postgres. There are cross-region read replicas. Now those replicas will be asynchronously replicated to they are their own database instances. So they're instances I'm gonna create, manage, and obviously pay for. And what this lets me do is asynchronously using physical replication, replicate to those instances. So this would be really useful if I have some very read heavy workload, or they could go and read from that replica over there. I could use it for disaster recovery. I could switch it to a read write mode, but once I do that, it breaks the connection to the original primary, and it's now just its own read-write replica. I can also use it to maybe migrate if I want to move between regions. So now, this is available, it's GA. PostgreSQL Flexible, so remember Flexible is that VM-based model. By basing it on the virtual machine, it gives me more flexibility in terms of hey, the number of configuration options that are available. I can have automatic optional high availability, so automatically fail over. I can stop and start it. I can use burstable VM. There's a whole set of benefits, understands zones with that flexible model over the old single, which was more of a container technology. But they've added some enhanced metrics. So these new metrics are one minute frequency. They're retained for 93 days and they're available across a whole range of different capabilities of the database. Um, activity, replication, database operations, traffic, saturation of resources, and many of them actually have dimensions to them. And dimensions means I can split it to maybe get more granularity at a particular instance of this object. Maybe I can even filter on them. So there's a whole set of new metrics available. Azure SQL MI managed instance now has transactional replication. So what this will let me do is I can now enable replication from Azure SQL MI or SQL Server to SQL Server or Azure SQL MI or even Azure SQL Database. So I can use this because it's transactional, I can use this in a bi-directional manner. So I can actually keep those different tables up to date. So it can be bi-directional if I want it to be. I could use it to migrate. There's a number of different ways I can use this, but that is now GA. There are some new 128 vCore options just using the standard series hardware, both for Azure SQL MI and Azure SQL Database in preview. And Azure SQL MI now has a database copy option. Now, this is there to both copy and move databases within the same subscription. So I have multiple Azure SQL MI instances, and I want to maybe just copy the database or actually move the database to another Azure SQL MI instance. Maybe they're not being utilized enough and I want to consolidate down. It's two phases. 
the first phase is I kick off the copy and it will do an asynchronous seeding of the target. So it's just gonna do the initial copy. And then when I'm ready to actually flip over, it will do an asynchronous catch up and then it can hey, bring it online and shut down the other one. So I have complete control of the timing of that second phase so it only flips over when I want it to. Miscellaneous, the Azure Monitor agent has finally custom log and IIS log support in GA. So the Azure Monitor agent is the new agent for monitoring. It replaces the old log analytics agent, the old diagnostics extension, the whole telegraph. It replaces all of those. It uses those new data collection rules to configure what we want to gather, which is much easier to manage. But now my text-based custom logs and my IIS logs, I can use now through rules to transfer into my log analytics workspace. There are a few requirements around the custom logs in terms of how it's delineated, um, times, etc. but they're all called out in the documentation. Building on from this, Azure Monitor Logs now has ingestion time translations. And if you consider, often we have data coming into our log analytics workspace, well, maybe sometimes the data is not in the right format. Maybe there's some data I wanna drop. Maybe there's certain fields I want to obfuscate so they don't get stored in the data. Whatever that might be, I can now pause the data coming in. I can extract, I can do transformations, and again, even drop data, and then send it for the actual storage into my log analytics workspace. So this is really gonna help me just store what I care about. And this applies to regular data that I capture, yes, through the Azure Monitor agent, um, with data collection rules, yes, with the old diagnostic settings and things like Sentinel, but also those custom logs. They've added some new services to the 12 months free that we often see. So if we jump over to the free site for a second, we can always go and sign up and there are groups of free services, some that are free for 12 months and then some that are just free forever or a certain amount is free forever. So we can see here, if we scroll down, it talks about Azure files. Now we get a certain amount of Azure files, LRS storage for free for 12 months. It also had information on media services, get a certain amount of that free for 12 months. And it also talks about for the, you can always do more, there's more stuff that's free for 12 months. And then there's things that are always free. You get a certain amount, for example, Azure functions, a million requests for free, just always, just forever, event grid, about 100,000 operations, Cosmos DB. So they've modified and given even more things that are both free for 12 months and some things that are free forever. So they've built up and enhanced those. So go and take a look. Moving on, the portal has got a number of updates. So actually my, my next bunch of updates are all around here. So in the mobile application, there's now some Azure Active Directory information available. In the regular web-based portal, they've added the fleet management for AKS. Remember, fleet management is now this overriding set of management capabilities for multiple AKS clusters. And then it also talks about, oh, sorry, I dropped over that, uh, the different components of that, databases, access, SAMI on Azure SQL, so that's a system assigned managed identity. From the mobile platform, VMs and NSGs, I can now have better integration and viewing the rules um, through those. And just a few other little updates. And to avoid me jumping back and forth, back and forth, so if we go back to the next update, there's also some cost management updates. So if we look at those as well, one of the interesting things here is tag inheritance. So tags do not normally get inherited. If I set a tag at a subscription or a resource group, it does not get inherited. Now I can make it be inherited. I can use Azure policy. So one of the things Azure policy could do is say, if my resource does not have this tag, then copy it from its parent subscription or parent resource group. But what this functionality is saying is, hey, for cost management purposes, you don't need to do that. It's going to, as part of the cost management section, let me turn on 
this tag inheritance capability really focused around the idea of, hey, grouping costs. Because one of the great things I could do with tags is I can filter my bill. So if I wanted to do chargeback, for example, to different groups in my company based on, hey, the tag is this cost center, I can break my bill down by those tags. So this is designed to say, hey, I don't wanna have to use policy. This is gonna make it easier for me to now do that tag inheritance. It gives me information about changes since the previous periods. You can see here, it's actually gonna show me, hey, my costs have dropped, for example, 9% in this example. I talked about the cost recommendations for VMSS in a previous update, and then there's some other cost management lab things. But as you can see, quite a few updates um, this week. And that was it. So as always, I hope this is useful. As always, have a fantastic week. And until next video, take care.